All right, it's good to see you here tonight. We are on session number eight. Can you believe that? Where has the summer gone? So, actually, I know where the summer's gone. It's gone in my office is where it's gone, studying for this and other things. Um, but it's good. It's been, uh, it's been fun. It's been challenging. Um, I've, I've found that the time has been uh, very challenging myself, just personally, uh, as I've gone through this material. I keep waiting for uh, an easier week to come. You know, when things will just like pop up and be like, oh, okay, this only took an hour to study for. Um, but one of the things I've been trying to do as we've been going through this is actually to stop and really give attention to the more difficult things, the things that tend to get brushed over, whether you're in a Bible study, uh, whether you're reading a commentary. I'm amazed at how many places, and some of you are some of your best commentaries. I'm not just talking about, uh, you know, an Ironsides devotional type of commentary or something else like that, but some of your more detailed commentaries that will, will go to a, a passage or they'll skip over a phrase because they just don't want to address it. And uh, so what I'm trying to do is, even if I don't know the answer and don't, I can't hand that to you, is at least say, here are the three possibilities so that you can... Uh, figure those out and, and understand, you know, why there's a little bit of discrepancy on trying to understand some of these things. So a, as you go through Daniel chapter 10 and Jan, Daniel chapter 11, I mean, there's some places here where, well, we're just kind of camp a little bit and, and talk about some of the possibilities and try to try to give the information on some of the background uh, to those things. And I certainly will offer um, at times my opinions on things uh, so that you have maybe uh, a, little, a little bit to go on there, or at least give you the opportunity to know, you know, there's not many people that are following this particular path, and this is the reason why. So tonight, uh, there's a couple things um, that we'll kind of um, uh, find ourselves looking at closely, and then really what we'll end up doing is trying to uh, ask some, maybe some questions. If there's something in your mind, I might be able to answer it, but probably not. Okay. So, if my microphone behaves, we'll be in really good shape. And I don't know why it's being naughty. But let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father in heaven, we thank you for our time together tonight. And we do pray, Lord, that as we consider the word of God, that you would just reward each one of the hearers here uh, as they have the opportunity to devote this time to it. Lord, we're reminded that everything you've given to us in your word has been given to us with the design that we would study and understand it. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for your revelation to us, and we pray that, that we would receive this instruction and understand it in such a way uh, that truly benefits us, Lord. And so we, we would just pray and ask for that measure of the Holy Spirit's guidance to be upon us tonight. So thank you again for bringing us all together this evening as we study session eight. May it be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bibles and go with me to Daniel chapter 10, if you would. Daniel chapter 10 is where we pick this up. Daniel is receiving here a vision. And uh, as he receives this vision, we're going to find that Daniel is uh, really going to be overcome by some of the things that he's experiencing. He's experiencing some really uh, difficult to handle truths, shall I say. And it becomes so difficult for him that he finds himself uh, really grappling physically with the revelation that he's receiving. So here it is in verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. Uh, that was that Babylonian name that he received. And the message was true and one of great conflict. But he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I did not eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my, my mouth, nor did I use any ointment uh, at all until the entire three weeks was completed. On the 24th day of the first month, while I was by the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, so obviously he's not there in, in Babylon, he's outside the city, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen 
whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Uphaz. His body also was like beryl, and his face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. And while the men who were with me did not see the vision, nevertheless a great dread fell on them. And they ran away to hide themselves. And so I was left alone and saw this great vision. Yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deadly, uh, a, a, really a pale. And I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words. And as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. And we haven't understood yet what is being spoken here, but you'll see that this the setting of this prophecy, the third year of Cyrus, that's 536 BC. And here we have the king of Prussia or Persia rather mentioned. And this message um, is revealed to Daniel here in this text. Daniel is going to say that the message that he receives was true and it's one of great conflict or great warfare. So at this point in time, what ends up happening that's so amazing is that Daniel is given, I think we're going to switch these microphones out, Daniel is given the opportunity to get a glimpse into the spiritual heavenlies uh, that not many people had the opportunity to see. Daniel has the opportunity <clears throat> here with this uh, to be able to see into a realm that previously we really don't have insight in. Uh, this passage of scripture would stand alone uh, by itself, given its significance, if nothing else surrounded it here in the book of Daniel. That's how potent what we're about to look at is. Where do we see in scripture glimpses into the heavenlies? Where do we have some revelation or opportunity to see into the heavenlies. Well, yes, we do. In Revelation, we have, uh, for instance, the tribulation saints. We have the 24 elders that are up in heaven. Uh, we have uh, the angels that are there in heaven. And we get a glimpse in the book of Revelation as to what is going on. What else do we see in Scripture? Paul in 2 Corinthians, where Paul has the opportunity to be caught up to the third heaven and it's there that he experiences uh, some wonderful things. I believe Paul is able to get a glimpse of the glory of Christ and, and see some things that uh, were never revealed to anyone prior to that. Jesus talked about that when he talked about it in, Roman, or in John chapter 17 when he's talking there about uh, the desire that he has for his saints to be able to behold his glory. It seems that Paul had the opportunity to see that. I think that's what's so special about Romans chapter 8, verse 28, when he talks about the present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glories that have been revealed or are to be revealed. Paul had insight that uh, we wouldn't normally receive. Any place else in the scriptures that we remember seeing a glimpse? Isaiah, okay, Isaiah. Paul has the Damascus. I, I, I'm not sure I would put that in there, but I know that with um, Isaiah having the opportunity uh, to see in the image of God there and, and to be able to, to know and understand that I'm unclean, you see all that interaction, that's pretty special there too. As you can see, there are not a lot of places where we have the opportunity uh, to look right into the heavenlies and see what's going on. What makes Daniel so unique is the fact that we're going to be introduced to some pretty special realities. And they are things that have impact on us today. Now, first thing we need to do is seek to identify who this man is who is standing before Daniel. Uh, we look at that and we say, well, who could this possibly be? And there are going to be pros and there are going to be cons kind of across the, uh, uh, across the board here. Uh, my seminary professor was uh, absolutely convinced uh, that this was a reference to the second person of the Godhead, that is Jesus Christ. He was absolutely convinced of that. If you take your Bibles and go back to Revelation chapter 1, uh, you'll see in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 13, the Revelation comes to John and he says, I saw one like the Son of Man 
clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across the chest with a golden sash. Head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. Eyes were like a flame of fire. Feet were like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of many waters. And the Bible says uh, some more things uh, about him. He placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. And if you have a red letter edition Bible, it's red right there when he says that. Because it's almost like, wow, woo, you know, that's it. You know, you got this revelation of itself. And so that there is definitely a description. And everyone would agree that that is a, a revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> when you come back here, you have uh, a similar expression here in Daniel chapter 10, which means that this could definitely be um, a reference here to Christ. The second possibility is it could be Gabriel. Well, why would you say Gabriel? How many angels do we know the names of in the scriptures? Michael and Gabriel, and what about the other guy? Let's not call him an angel. We'll call him a fallen agent. Right, right. We have to put that little disqualifier on there. How many good angels do you know in Scripture? Two. Two. How many angels are there? Could have called 10,000 of angels, right, as the song goes, and that, that talks about that. Uh, interestingly here, uh, if it would be Gabriel, uh, and some people think that it is Gabriel, the concept here that Christ as we're going to find later on here in this chapter, could be held up for three weeks by a demon is impossible for some people to, to stop and consider. How is that possible that God himself could be prevented? And the only way we would say that that would be possible is if Jesus is laying aside some of his power, some of his attributes. And that is certainly a possibility. A third possibility would be what? An anonymous angel. <laughs> An anonymous angel. It could be a third angel. Dr. Leanne Wood, uh, in his writings, says that uh, it's very likely that it is a third unidentified angel, a, an angelic being that uh, is not disclosed. And I think that that's very, very possible. In fact, for me, that solves a lot of these big issues because, again, when we look at the Christophany aspect, if it is a Christophany, you really have to figure out why and how Jesus could be prevented. So stop and think about it before you say, absolutely, uh, this is uh, what it is. Because when you realize what is happening here a little bit later, it might change how you think about it. So we find here um, that while Daniel is receiving this vision, the men that were with Daniel do not see it. They're not able to, to understand it. And yet, their reaction must have been because of how Daniel responded. They could see that there was something different about Daniel. The Bible says he's, he got pale. He just he turned white. Uh, he lost the color in his face. And all of a sudden there, uh, everything changed, complexion, attitude, and everything with Daniel. They knew from Daniel's previous experiences, no doubt, uh, that the Lord was dealing with him at times. And so... With this in mind, uh, they thought to themselves, we need to get out of here. So they split. And they left Daniel alone, which was perfect, because God wanted to deal with him. He says, I was alone, and I saw this great vision, and yet no strength was left in me. And so there he is, just wilting. And when he hears the words of uh, this man, the Bible says that as soon as he heard the sound, he fell into a, a deep sleep, and he went right down on his face, with his face to the ground. And then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. So there is Daniel. He's on his face before God or before this man, depending on how you interpret it. And he is touched. And there he is, able to receive this strength. And he's able to, to get back up. So he comes to his point where he's on his hands and, he knee, and his knees. And uh, this one says to Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words I'm about to tell you and stand upright. Literally standing, standing upright, for I have now been sent to you. 
And I find that interesting there. You have Daniel who is, he's not prone before this man. And there's a couple things here that make me question whether or not it's a Christophany. One is that if it was a Christophany, uh, why didn't Daniel immediately go to his face? Uh, when Moses encountered the burning bush and uh, theophany, which we mentioned all theophanies really are Christophanies, when that encounter happened, what was Moses told? Do you remember? Take your shoes off because you're standing on holy ground. And what made the ground holy? The presence of God, exactly. So you don't have that here with Daniel. The other thing you don't have with Daniel or makes you, you question the Christophany is where it says here uh, that I have now been sent to you. There are places where Jesus has been sent by God the Father. There, there's no question about that. I can take you to those places in Scripture. However, here in this situation, given this context, it seems a little bit unusual uh, that Jesus would be kind of relegated, I would say, to messenger status. But that's what an angel truly is, is a messenger. He is one who is carrying out the will of God the Father um, in that role. I know that both of those things don't necessarily disqualify uh, this from being a Christophany, but they cause me to question whether or not this is a slam dunk Christophany. So either way, Daniel receives word of this and he stands up trembling in verse 11. And the words are spoken to him, do not be afraid. The first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. Daniel, I want you to know God is saying, absolutely, this has been going on for quite a while. Since you set your heart to understand it, uh, your, your words were heard immediately. And he says, I've come in response to your words. But in verse 13, we're introduced to the dilemma. He explains this three-week delay, 21 days. Uh, in verse 13, he says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withholding or withstanding me. Literally, that word withstanding means to be standing in front of. He was standing in front of me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now, the description, I, I grant you, when you read the description, it seems like this is a Christophany. But when you come to that passage, doesn't it make you think a little bit more? Because you look at it and you say, well, how is it that, that Jesus, who is God, couldn't just blow the guy out of the way? You know, what do you mean he's standing in front of you? And, and, and Jesus couldn't get past him. And this went on for three whole weeks until Jesus uh, called for the archangel to come and give him a hand. And between the two of them there, their power and strength was able then to move this other demon out of the way. And it's never even mentioned that this other demon is Satan. He is just given uh, an anonymous status. So it really makes you wonder whether or not this truly is a Christophany or if we're dealing with uh, another angel. Obviously, it can't be Michael. He was the one who was summoned, okay? So he's the one who, who comes and is able to give heed. Let's look at this this way. The prince of the kingdom of Persia. What an interesting description. It's speaking there about a demon who has ties to a particular nation. Right, So what we're seeing is that there is a spiritual warfare that's going on. And this spiritual warfare is happening in such a way that we have the prince. And that's a demon or a fallen angel, if you want to term it that way. And he has a tie to where? Who was the king of Persia? Do you remember? Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great. Was Cyrus the Great used by God? Yes, he was. Uh, do you think that was by accident? No. Do you think that there was a spiritual battle that was raging surrounding 
the working in the heart of Cyrus the Great? Well, I would almost guarantee you that there was. Uh, Cyrus the Great never pretended to be a believer, really, and I don't, I don't know, has he ever turned his heart over to God? I mean, there's some mention there, but we don't really know. The truth of the matter is Persia is very, very powerful, and Persia has demonic activity surrounding it. Now, what's fascinating, and this really is a, a fascinating, fascinating passage of Scripture. Verse 13, when he says he was withstanding me for 21 days, Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me, for I'd been left there with the kings of Persia. Now, there's no way for you to see that uh, in the, unless you were looking at the Hebrew. But you see that little phrase, for I had been left there? I had been left there? When he mentions that he had been left there, um, this angel it hadn't been left behind. Uh, in Hebrew here, it carries the idea to be left in a position of preeminence. So he was still in a position of influence over Persia. And that's really what the Hebrew is saying there. For I had been left there. I had been victorious there with the kings of Persia is really the, the message that should convey out of that. So there is a struggle that's taking place in the heavenlies, and it's a struggle between spiritual beings who are trying to control the actions of a nation. Now, that's fascinating to me. You know, we got a big election coming up in our country, right? And, and there's probably all types of uh, activity that's going on. I think there's still activity going on in Persia. Who's Persia today? That's right. Iran is a huge, huge player uh, in all of this. Iraq is a huge player in all of this. It's fairly fascinating what is happening in the world today. And nations are being influenced by spiritual, angelic beings on both sides of the aisle. So you have the righteous who are seeking that, that position of influence while you have Satan trying to do his best to influence it in his direction. Ultimately, all things work together for good. And ultimately, God is the one who's guiding the affairs of men. But understand this, that we are getting a glimpse here in Daniel of something that we have never seen before. And that is the spiritual warfare that is taking place. So you have this huge collision uh, be between this, this man here and uh, this angelic being or Jesus, uh, depending on how you see it, and he is able uh, to only do so much. He has to call for Michael. Michael arrives, and between the joint forces of those two, they're able to affect change and gain the victory. And so this is what Daniel's being told. How would you like to be told that if you were Daniel? Would that be mind-boggling? I mean, I, yeah, I couldn't get here for three weeks. Well, what happened? You know? You know, I mean, normal stuff is like, you know, well, a camel, you know, he threw a rod, and, you know, it was, you know we were at a rest stop for two weeks, and, you know, you know something happened that prevented me. And, and, and here's this one in front of him, and he's telling him about this warfare that's taking place in the heavens. I mean, this is... This is beyond human comprehension as it comes to him. Keep that in mind as, as we hear more about Daniel. Verse 14, it doesn't get any easier. He says, now I've come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people. Who's your people? The Jewish people. To your people. Remember, Daniel's not living in Israel, is he? He's not living in Israel. But his people are still his people. His people are the Jewish people. And he says, this is going to happen in these latter days. Uh, for the vision pertains to the days, and it's really in the Hebrew, it's many days future. This is a long time period down the road for you, Daniel. But this is what's going to happen with your people. And you're going to understand that in these latter days, these are the things that are going to transpire. I mean, it gets your appetite really wet for what's going to happen, right? I mean, this is kind of like, whoa, you know, this angel from the Lord or God himself has come, and either way, God's giving revelation, and he's telling us this is what's going to happen at the end of it all. Whew, man. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground 
and I became speechless. I think all of us would uh, no doubt become speechless. I think all of us would be absolutely overwhelmed hearing about Michael. I mean, there, there's not even that many places in the whole Old Testament. There are only three references in the Old Testament to Michael, and he's never called the archangel until you get to Jude 9. Uh, all three of the references to Michael are in the Dan book of Daniel. You go to the New Testament, you pick it up in uh, Revelation 12, 7, and also, as I mentioned, uh, in Jude, where he's wrestling uh, over the body of Moses. I mean, there's a contention that's going on there, and that in itself is, is mind-boggling. So um, he says, basically, after this, this fighting has been over and, and is done, he says, I, I was able to come to you. And so Daniel is speechless. Behold, one who resembled a human being was touching my lips. I opened my mouth and spoke and said to him who was standing before me, O my Lord, as a result of the vision, anguish has come upon me. Again, I'm not sure the address, and this is where I would have a problem as well with it being a Christophany, is the address, O my Lord, is not significant enough to warrant a Christophany. That, that's just in, in my thought. He would say that to uh, another angel. Um, he's not using a, a name for anything divine here at this point, which is a little bit different than people's encounters previous. As a result of the vision, anguish has come upon me, and I retain no strength. For how can such a servant of my Lord talk with such as my Lord? As for me, there remains just now no strength, nor has any breath even been left in me. Then this one with human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man of high esteem, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Take courage and be courageous. Take courage and be courageous. I think that's the word for the future, don't you? I think that's the word for the future. I really do. I think that what God is saying to him is that, uh, you know, it's not going to get bright before it gets dark. It's going to be bright, but it's going to get dark first. There's going to be some really rough times ahead for the people of Israel. And eventually, it will come to pass where there's tremendous victory, and the millennial kingdom lies in front of you. But you're going to have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. And so I think these words are, are very, very fitting uh, for terminology associated with the end times, and that's courageousness. Now, as soon as he spoke to me, I received strength, and I said, May my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And he said, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. He had gained that victory, but now he needed to go back because this continual warfare was not ending. This spiritual warfare, my friends, is going on 24-7. Remember that when you go to sleep tonight. There is a spiritual war in the heavenlies that is raging the whole night while you and I will be sleeping. That's the reality. I mean, the angel of the Lord or Jesus, depending on what it is, is going to have to go right back to the fight. And you know what's happening? The stakes are getting higher. Notice, read that scripture that follows. So I'm going forth and behold, the prince or the demon that's associated with Greece is about to come. Glory, hallelujah, we just got through fighting. I couldn't even get to you for three weeks. I needed Michael to come. And now we've got the demon that's associated with Greece. Who's the world power after Persia? Greece. Greece. Uh, you see, the world powers are lining up. And all of these things that God is doing, and in our situation, we're looking back on history. So we're looking back on history, and from our vantage point, we're looking at it and saying, these are all the things God has done, right? As soon as God gave the prophecy concerning the future to Daniel, Satan is going to set out to try not to allow it to come to pass because that's what he does. And if he could break that power of that prophecy, he could gain victory, but he can't. But there's a war. It just doesn't come like this. Uh, there's a warfare that's going on makes us appreciate, I think, the things that God's doing for us more. It, it really does. Not only did Jesus Christ come and die so that we can have eternal life, but he continually is battling for us, making this plan that we talk about so flippantly at times, right? 
oh, he's working all things together for good. Do we have any clue as to what that is? I don't think so. I don't think any of us do. I think we'll all be shocked, amazed, flabbergasted, whatever the terminology is, when we finally get to heaven and we go, whoa, Lord, you did this. Can I just praise you for the next 100 million years just for that? Okay. It is, it's like he is worthy to be praised, and we're, we're going to see what he has done. And it's, it's, just, uh, it's just truly outstanding uh, what, God has, uh, what God has done. So here you have the, this prince. You have this immediate struggle, the princes of Persia. Now Greece seem to be uniting against the angel or Christ. Now this may be a, a prophetic picture of, of really what unfolds in the future. Uh, but when we look at this... Um, we, we see that God is, is doing a great work. I want you to just um, to take a little trip with me uh, back over to Revelation. Revelation chapter 9. While we're on the topic of this warfare that is going on, In chapter 9, we have the trumpet judgments. The trumpet judgments, if you were to look at the, uh, if you were to look at the time of the seven years of tribulation, uh, the seven trumpet judgments, begin pretty much here. In the center point, and these are very close here to the end, those remaining trumpet judgments. The vile judgments, the bold judgments, will actually be towards the end, mainly right there at the very end as well. But I want you to pick this up because you see here the sixth trumpet in verse 13, Revelation 9, 13, then the sixth angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound in the great river Euphrates. I'll bet you didn't know that. Now, maybe you did. Four terrible, powerful demons are enslaved. They're bound. You remember where it says that Satan will be bound for a thousand years? Same Greek word. They are bound in the great Euphrates River. And it is very close to the end of the tribulation time that they will be released. And the Bible says here they've been prepared for the hour and day, month and year, and they are released so that they would, get this, kill one-third of humanity. That's one-third of the people that are still living at that point in time. Many have already died. But the Bible says the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. So that we know that what's happening here, that's going to be at the end of the tribulation time when that takes place. And so this is close to the end of this time period and how terrible that is. Take your Bibles and flip over to Revelation chapter 16, I believe it is, here. The sixth angel and the six bowls of wrath poured out his bowl on the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for those 200 million, the kings to the east. So keep that in mind, too, while we kind of journey on here. And I don't know, are we going to get to chapter 11 tonight? Maybe. Um, we will. Uh, but these are important things for us to, to know. We have, we have a lot of things that are going on. There's a huge spiritual battle, and it will continue to rage right on through the end of this tribulation time. And remember, hell, the lake of fire, was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's who it's meant for. Unfortunately, when man sinned, he doomed himself to an eternity there. But then Jesus stepped in, and Jesus gives eternal life and deliverance from that penalty for all who would believe in him. But understand this important reality. There is a spiritual warfare that's going on. How? If this spiritual warfare is going on, how can we be a part of helping Christ and helping God with his plan? From all the way down here, what can we possibly do? We can pray. We can pray. The only way you and I have access 
to the spiritual warfare that is going on is through prayer. And yet prayer, I believe, is a very powerful agent. Uh, God's people praying uh, for the spiritual victories to be won, for God's will to be done, is huge. It's, it's really, really huge. And so isn't it sobering when you stop and you think about it? All things that are going on in the world today are all being influenced and impacted by this spiritual warfare that you and I cannot see. You and I can't see it. Part of the role of the church is to, with the Holy Spirit's strength and power, be able to hold back sin. Uh, that's part of our, our responsibility as well as Christians. And we want to be able to do that in such a way uh, that, that pleases the Lord. So it's quite a chapter in chapter 10. It really is. And uh, it's, it's worthy of our study. But go now with me to chapter 11. And we want to try to interpret further the vision. The first year of Darius the Mede, I arose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings are going to arise in Persia. A fourth will gain more riches than all of them. And as soon as he becomes strong enough through his riches, he'll arouse the whole empire against the realm of Greece. A mighty king will arise. He'll rule with great authority and do as he pleases. But as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom will be broken up, parceled out toward the four points of the compass. Who is that a reference to? Alexander the Great. Great. Good, good job, students. Um, so four of these... Four of these points of the compass, those were the four generals that they broke the empire up for. And so it says, though not to his own descendants, nor according to his authority, which he wielded, for his sovereignty will be uprooted and given to others besides him. We know that's exactly what happens with Alexander the Great. Then the king of the south will grow strong. Who was the king of the south? This is obviously a, a prophecy. And you'll notice in your notes, chapter 11, uh, we have a prophecy concerning Persia. We have a prophecy concerning Greece. We have uh, under, under Greece, you could put A and B. A and B. A is Alexander the Great. B is the division of the kingdom. And then number three should be a prophecy concerning the kings of the north and the kings of the south. And number four, a prophecy concerning Antiochus Epiphanes. So when we look at the kings of the north and the south, who's that a reference to? Well, that's a reference. Uh, the southern king is the Ptolemy scenario. You have Ptolemy I, Ptolemy II, Ptolemy III. Um, and then to the north, you have the Seleucids. Remember, Antiochus Epiphanes is going to come out of the Seleucid part of the empire. The Seleucids and the Ptolemies are going to try to make a deal. They are fighting, they are warring, but they figured it out. If your kid marries my kid and they have a child, that child will rule. Makes, sounds like a good deal, right? So the king of the north marries the girl from the south. You know what her name was? Bernice. Oh, Bernice. That was Ptolemy's daughter. And she was supposed to marry this Antiochus, the king of the north. And her son was going to be the heir to the Seleucid throne. But here's the problem. Antiochus, <laughs> he was already married. And his wife was ticked off. And she was nuts. Which is probably why the marriage didn't really work out all that great in the first place. So she said, okay, fine, you're going to marry Bernice, and what happens to me? They were estranged at this point. Um, her name is very much like the word Laodicea, but Laodice, Laodice, I'm not sure my Seleucid accent is missing. Um, she ended up killing Antiochus, and for good measure, she killed Bernice too. <laughs> if that wasn't enough, she killed a kid. I mean, she just, she just wiped them all out, and uh, she ruled as the queen until her little son was grown up enough to take over. So all things just kind of rolling along. At this point in time, all the way down to verse 35, you have historical content dealing with these empires leading up to Antiochus. Now, for sake of time, we have already spent a great deal of time talking about Antiochus. What I'd like to do is get you to go to verse 36. 
Because at verse 36, and you'll want to make a note of it, verse 36 shifts. That's where the big shift is. And this warfare then is taking place during the 70th week. All right, so you see your notes there on page 3. We have the 70th week. Now, can I get a volunteer to come up here and write out Daniel's 70 weeks vision? All right. Be that way. <laughs> How many weeks did we have in the very beginning? It was 49 years, right? 49 years and then 434 years. Um, this was the rebuilding of the temple, correct? Correct me if I'm wrong because one week I forget everything. Okay, yes, we had the decree in the beginning, rebuild the temple. We believe here um, that the temple is... is done around 409 BC. Um, and, and so here you go with the decree. It's 434. You come up with, what is it, 580 something? 483? That sounds perfect. And then we come to, at the end of this, we come into the church age. When did the church age end? I'm just seeing if you're paying attention. Church age hasn't ended yet. It will end at the rapture. That's correct. After that parentheses. Now, I want you just to stop and think with me again, just so this kind of gets ingrained in our brain. This is all about what nation? Rebuilding. Okay, so the temple. This is Israel. How about this period of time? All about Israel. How about the church age? It's about Jews and Gentiles, correct? Started off, it was Jews who were putting their faith in Jesus, some Gentiles, and then it became mostly Gentiles, and that's the way it is today. Yes, there are certainly uh, saved Jews, uh, Messianic saints, however you want to call them. That's awesome. We're all part of the same body of Christ. That's fantastic. That's the church age. It is going on today. It will come to a very abrupt halt when the rapture takes place. After the rapture takes place, you are now in another one-week period. So up until this point, we have two weeks, we have 67 weeks. That equals what? Oh, 69 weeks. Daniel's prophecy is for 70. Here's the 70th week right here. It is seven years in duration. So it's during this period of seven years that you're going to see verse 36 to the end of the chapter um, spoken about here so that we understand this is what's happening. We have verse 36. In verse 36, first thing we need to do is understand that the subject change has gone from Anti uh, Antiochus to Antichrist. Verse 36 describes, then the king will do as he pleases. This new king is not designated as a king of the north or a king of the south. Uh, he is um, here uh, not a reference to Antiochus. Uh, Antiochus, in fact, is really not uh, called a king but just one time. Uh, and we understand as well we have a separation here with the king of the south, which will be mentioned later, and the king of the north. And I believe that this is a reference clearly to Antichrist. And I would say that all the theologians pretty much have the same take on this. There's really not discrepancy when it comes to understanding who this person is in verse 36. Antiochus was proud, and he wanted to magnify himself above any other god, small g. However, he always worshipped the gods of Greece, and he demanded the same from the Jewish people. This king is not going to do that at all. In fact, there are several things about this king that really stand out. He will exalt and magnify himself above every small god. Now, there's a whole bunch of things here that I just made a list of. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of camp out on this. All right? And, and just look at a couple things. Before I do, I just have one question. Let's take a little break here. So 
just for scientific reasons. But how many of you think that in chapter 10, that's a reference to Christ? That Christ is the person in that passage? All right. Couple, three or four. Good, good. How many think it's uh, Gabriel? All right. A few of you do. Could be Gabriel. And how many think it might be an unknown angel or you don't have any idea and neither do I? Okay. I shouldn't have done it like that, right? <laughs> yeah, you're voting multiple times. That's, that's sketchy. Wait till the general election. You can vote as many times as you want. Dead or alive, doesn't really matter. You know? Oh. All right, coming here to chapter 11, I just like getting you to think about it. I mean, and I'm just totally trying to be as totally honest with everything as I can be so that, you know, you can kind of go through the process yourself and, and think through uh, the logic and the points there. And, and uh, I, I don't think there's any harm um, by understanding it one way or the other. Noticing here this passage of Scripture in verse, uh, notice with your, look at your notes for just a second. This king is a willful king. The Bible says the king will do as he pleases. Um, that's speaking of a lot of power. He has a lot of authority. He magnifies himself against every god. Uh, for that which is decreed, verse 36, um, you'll notice that. If you look down there, um, you'll see that. So let's just kind of go through this, this passage. And let me just say, no ancient king fulfills these prophecies. Um, and they are agreeing with other end time passages. <clears throat> so he starts out, he's going to magnify himself above every God. He's going to speak monstrous things against the one true God, the God of gods. So he clearly comes out as an opponent. I'm in verse 36. He comes out as an opponent to the one true God. And he will prosper until the indignation is finished. Uh, when it's talking there about the indignation, um, uh, the word there is a reference. It's actually the same uh, Hebrew word as is used over in chapter 8 uh, in, in verse 19. <clears throat> and he says, Behold, I'm going to let you know that what will occur at the final period of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. That's chapter 8 and verse uh, 19. If you want a cross-reference, the interesting thing is the time of this indignation is the tribulation time. So he's going to be able to go until the very end of the tribulation time, and that's when it will be over when Jesus Christ comes back. And then he says, for that which is decreed will be done. What do you think has been decreed? What has been decreed? Right here. Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. That's what's been decreed. God has already made the decree. God let it out and said, this is what's going to happen. It's all right there for you to see. Notice here, as you go on, he will show, the Bible says, no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. So verse 37 tells us uh, that uh, he has certain characteristics. He shows no regard for the gods of his fathers. There's no, there's no interest in the family or ancestral religion that has been part of his past. So what he's done is he's basically stepped away from his spiritual roots and instead is going to go another direction. All right? And so... When you look at this passage, the religion that was part of his world, previous, there is no regard for it. He is going to take on various characteristics. Notice he says here uh, that he is basically... Uh, going to shun, and it says here in your English translation, 
He shows no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women. And there have been a lot of things talked about with regard to this person. Um, some people have said, well, we think that the Antichrist will be homosexual in nature. We think the Antichrist will just not have interest in women at all, that he's just totally focused. And that's pretty much how I have understood it. However, there's another possibility. And this possibility is talked about by, by several theologians, and it does have merit. The thought may be that the desire which, which is typically normative for a woman, and I'm talking about characteristics of mercy, gentleness, and kindness, is not there present in him. A second translation possibility is, and I see this quite a bit, or for the desire, not for the desire of a woman, but for the God, the God of women, all right, women's gods. In other words, thinking that women being spiritually motivated perhaps more than men, and I'm starting to see that more too. I don't put a lot of credibility in it, but I'm just going to throw that out there so that you see it. So it's very possible that it's not a question of, of him not being interested in women. Maybe it is a characteristic thing that he is, has pushed aside. I'm going to still go back to my original thought process, and I'm going to say that I think what it is is he's not interested in women because he is so focused on what is happening, and his desire to be worshipped is really what it comes down to. And that's where he is gearing all of his, his attention. So that's where, that's where I come down on that. And I think that's where I've always come down on that. Okay, So when I look at this, uh, he has obviously resisted his previous religion. He is totally focused. And the Bible says here, uh, instead, he's going to magnify himself very clearly above everything else in life. He has no regard for those gods. He has no regard for women. He's going to show regard, nor will he show regard for any other god. For he will magnify himself above them all. But instead, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold and silver, costly stones and treasures. Now, I'll be very honest with you. As I've studied this passage of Scripture in the past, most of the time, God of fortresses tends to be skipped over uh, because it's very difficult to try to understand uh, what this is a reference to. Uh, what does he mean when he says God of fortresses? Um, we're saying here that he is clearly not going to be following his ancestral religion. Instead, he is going to turn and he's going to direct his attention over uh, to something brand new, something totally different. Now, here's where it gets fascinating. I'm just going to give you some possibilities, and you're going to have to decide for yourself uh, where your, your thought process comes down. When he mentions the god of fortresses, the term fortresses there, um, is when it's translated in other places in the scripture, um, sometimes it's translated, you can write this down, defense. Uh, I've seen it um, in some of my Bibles as God of forces. I've seen it uh, here, God of fortresses in New American Standard. It's also in places translated helmet. Protection is another word. Refuge. Safety, strength, strong, stronghold, and strongholds. So there's a whole bunch of ways in which it is interpreted um, and translated. Interestingly, too, in the Greek, when you look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew, when I think of the word uh, strongholds or fortresses, I think of Corinthians, you know, pulling down the strongholds. It is not the same Greek word in the Septuagint, so it doesn't link over. Instead, uh, the word, uh, it's, it's an interesting term, and I, I, I can write it, uh, which way should I write it? Uh, 
There you go. You can pronounce that any way you want. <laughs> Probably meozim is, is another way, M-A-O-Z-I-M, meozim. And back in the 1900s, uh, 19, or 1898, uh, many people thought, and this is where your translation of like the Latin Vulgate, and you have Jerome, and you had some other early scholars, they always looked at this as a name. They looked at it as a, a name, a, 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 an actual title, an actual name of someone. And later on, uh, most theologian, theologians have kind of gone away from that. Okay, But here's the interesting thing. The name is actually, if you can see this, al Muiz, the giver of honor. It's one of the 99 names for Allah, which I thought was interesting. Hmm. And you can go back through and you can find writing about this, uh, a god that is unknown to this person's ancestors. Uh, could it be, and, and a lot of this is obviously conjecture, uh, but the, some of those earlier theologians thought that this was a name, um, the god of, and they gave it that name, one of the names of Allah. That's pretty fascinating, especially in today's uh, scenario. And, and you could look at it and say, well, if he's uh, stepped away from his religion, obviously he's converted to something else. Um, no matter how you determine, he has converted in a sense. Now, I use the term converted very loosely. I'm not speaking of a true spiritual conversion, but he's gone from worshiping one thing to worshiping another thing. Keep in mind, Jesus' teachings, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He said, you'll either serve me or you'll serve money. It'll be one of the two. You make the decision. Now, money is not a true uh, God, but it can become obviously an idol. Keeping that in mind, any false deity violates the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other God before me. So if this person came from a Christian background or a Jewish background, converted over to Islam, he could be said to be following the God of Amazim. All right, so, so that is one possibility, and that's a possibility that was thought of uh, many years ago. The difficulty with that is that there are six other places in Daniel that translate that same Hebrew word as stronghold. So that's the reason why it gets translated over here as fortresses. The other prevailing, and really the number one prevailing view, would be that the god of forces or god of fortresses is that basically he is uh, truly focused on warfare and power, okay? And he's just seeking to feed that, and that's what has become his God. Just like for us, money could become our God, pleasure could become our God, et cetera, et cetera. And so he is fixated on power. He's fixated on strength, and he is pursuing that with all the vigor possible. And he's going uh, 100 miles an hour after that. I'll give you a third possibility of what it could be tongue-in-cheek, it could be, as one writer wrote, a reference to literally forces. When you think of forces, you think of electricity and magnetic pulses and light, and it's all because the Internet's going to control the world in the future, and robots, so there's his view, okay. So, and uh, yeah, that's out there pretty far. Um, so. No, I don't really take that view seriously, okay? But one of these other two views I think is very, um, uh, very easy to, to see and make a case for, um, and you can kind of go through and process both of those aspects. He's going to honor a god of fortresses. Is it an honor of God of strength? A god his fathers did not know. Um, he'll honor him with gold and silver, costly stones and treasures. It's almost like, is he taking those things for himself, and those are a mark of his power, those are a mark of his strength, or is he taking these things, these uh, gems and this gold and silver, and uh, giving them to uh, a false god? 
Well, the Bible says that he will take action against the strongest of fortresses. Now, I want to show you something that's kind of interesting to me. He's going to take action against the strongest of fortresses, these strongholds. And he's going to do so with the help of a foreign god. What does that mean? The help of a foreign god. Uh, there must be something here that would, would really relate to this. Uh, it tells me that he is going to need another country that is militarily very powerful because it's going to need to be utilized by him to go in and gain the victory in these other places. Okay? And so my wheels turn just like yours. We're always thinking, where's the United States come in? And we really don't know. The Bible really doesn't tell us, and I'm not about to throw it out there. But it's interesting, isn't it, that here is this leader who is capable of incredible warfare. I mean, he has the amazing military machine of the world. And as we go through a little further here, because I can see our time is, is getting away, we're not going to be able to, to venture into the, um, the next section. But he is going to have that military capability. If the Lord is coming soon, and I'm talking about with the playing field basically set as it is, you would expect that the United States, with our military uh, ability, to be a major factor here for the Antichrist. Uh, I, I don't know uh, other ways that you can, can ignore this. I'm not sure who else would be able to come to his aid. You have Israel, for instance. Israel, Israel is a very powerful military uh, nation. They have to be in order to be able to protect themselves. But because of their size, uh, they are not able to do the things that we're going to see need to be done. The king of the north and the king of the south in the subsequent passage that we'll be studying next week are major, major players. And you see how they are coming against the Antichrist from two different directions, and they're converging on him. And when you look at who these countries most likely are, you realize that this is a, an enormous, enormous battle. In fact, when we see the invasions taking place next week, we're going to see basically the Battle of Armageddon. I want you to keep this in mind. The Battle of Armageddon, the word battle as it's used in the scripture, is the word polemic. It's speaking there not of a, there's two different words for battles in the scriptures. One is a battle that is here and now, victories won, victories lost. The other, polemic, is speaking about a long, drawn-out battle. Think of like World War II, okay? It's going to be something that's going to take place for years versus Battle of the Bulge or, you know, something else that's, that's here's our battle, this is where it takes place, it's over. We sometimes think Battle of Armageddon is just going to be everybody assembles, they all arrive there about 12 minutes before D-Day, and uh, Jesus comes back, lights them all up, and it's over. But actually, the, the reality is it's a long process that takes place, and it takes place, as I understand it, it's going to take place from the midpoint of the tribulation to the very end, and it will be finished when Jesus Christ comes back. All right. So that's kind of something to keep in mind, that, that word... Uh, is really a, a key point to help us to understand it. So here he is. He is getting this help, and he will give great honor to those who acknowledge him. And he's going to cause them to rule over the many. So as the Antichrist goes in to conquer different areas, if the people are responsive to him, he will set them up with positions of authority to be able to rule. And they will come down with the iron fist just as he does. Remember, the Antichrist, according to the book of Revelation, will be requiring a mark to be able to buy or sell anything, and he wants to have that enforced. And so he will do that enforcing as he goes out into the world and he's conquering. And he will use the opportunity uh, to elevate people. Notice the next part. I think this is an important part. He will parcel out land for a price. How's he going to finance his operations? I'll make you a ruler. You're bowing the knee to me. 
I'll make you a ruler. I'll give you responsibility. You can crack down on anybody who names the name of Christ. You know, take them and behead them. And, uh, oh, by the way, it's going to cost you something. And so people will pay the Antichrist for the opportunity to rule over that piece of ground. And that financially will help him to keep going and will strengthen him tremendously. And I'm sure as well, uh, everybody who uses one of those uh, credit card purchases through the chip in their head or whatever um, will probably pay 1% <laughs> for that purchase and it'll go straight to this one world leader. Um, but that's what's happening here in this passage of scripture with this huge king um, known as the Antichrist. Well, we're going to break right here because if I go into the rest of this passage, which I had every intent to do, um, we will absolutely get way, way behind uh, the time frame. But uh, does anybody have any uh, question? I can take time for a, a question here. All right, let's have a word of prayer. God, we just give you thanks, for we realize, Lord, that even as a spiritual battle overhead rages, Father, there is no one like you. There is no one who can compare to you. Uh, you alone are the creator of the universe. You are alone all-powerful. There is no one who's omnipotent except for you. And we pray, Lord, that we would uh, truly commit to prayer, Lord, uh, the things that are happening that we can't even see, praying that your will would be done, praying, Father, for you to be glorified, praying, Father, uh, that the end of times would provide man with an opportunity to place their faith in Jesus. And Father, we just thank you again for the opportunity that we have to pick apart the words of Scripture. And Lord, I pray that you guide us. We truly are seeking to know the meaning behind these very words that are before us. And we thank you again for giving them to us. May future generations, as you tarry, be able to see your truth revealed as well. Lord, we know that even though we see through a glass darkly today, one day we'll see face to face our Savior. We just look forward to that. So guide us, Lord. Help us to live for you today that we might truly honor you in all things. For it's in Christ's name we pray.